So good morning all, uh, it's sharp 10 a.m. And we have with us uh, uh, Barry Fisher, sir, for uh, taking a session on forensic science in United States and the possible lessons for the India, what all possibility we can take in the India. Thank you, sir, uh, for accepting our invitation for delivering lecture on uh, lecture on this topic. And we welcome on behalf of Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science. Uh, Barry, sir, uh, was a director of the Crime Laboratory, Los Angeles County Sheriff Department. Here, uh, on behalf of Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science, we welcome all the participants along with my co-host, Cesar Azim. I will request Cesar to give a brief introduction about the Barry Fisher, sir. Although his profile is very, very long, but we are just cutting short and getting some brief idea about our esteemed speaker. Thank you for accepting our invitation, sir. Cesar, over to you. Thank you, sir. I would start with introducing uh, Barry A.J. Fisher, who has served as the Crime Lab Director for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, a position that he has held from 18, 1987 until his retirement in 2009. He began his career in criminalistic with the Sheriff's Crime Lab in 1969 and worked in a wide variety of assignments. His current interest concerns the interrelationship between forensic science and the law along with public policy issues. Concerning the timely delivery of the quality of forensic support services to the criminal justice system, he served as a member of the American Bar Association Criminal Justice Section's Ad Hoc Committee to ensure the integrity of criminal process. Fisher is a member of many professional organizations he is a distinguished fellow and past president of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences and was awarded the Academy's highest award, the Gradual Medallion. He served as president of the International Association of Forensic Sciences, president of the American Society of Crime Lab Directors and a past chairman of the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors Laboratory Accreditation Board. He is the founding director and served on the board of directors of the National Forensic Science Technology Center from 1995 until 2007. Mr. Fisher has been a member of several editorial boards, the Journal of Forensic Sciences, the Journal of Forensic Identification, Forensic Science Policy and Management, Forensic Science Research, and the McGraw-Hill Encyclopedia of Science and Technology. Fisher is an alumni member of the Council of Scientific Society Presidents and a life member of International Association of Chiefs of Police and was a member of ICP's, IACP's Forensic Committee. His textbook, Technique of Crime Scene Investigation, in its eighth edition, enjoys wide popularity. He is a co-author of two other books, Forensic Demystified and Introduction to Criminalistic, The Foundation of Forensic Science. Fisher speaks throughout the United States and has lectured in Canada, England, Australia, Singapore, France, Israel, Japan, China, Turkey, Dubai, and Portugal on forensic science laboratory practices, quality assurances, and related topics. In 2000, he led a forensic science delegation to lecture to forensic scientists in the People's Republic of China. In 2012, he was invited again to China to lecture on forensic science developments in the United States. In 2017, he was invited to be a guest plenary speaker at the Forensic Science Conference in Dubai. Since retiring, Fisher has consulted for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the United States Department of Justice, International Criminal Investigative Training Programs, and Analytic Service Inc., a not-for-profit institute that provides studies and analysis to aid decision makers in national security, homeland security, and public safety. 
He also consults on forensic service matters. Fisher grew up in the Bronx in New York, New York City and received his Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry from the City College of New York. He holds a Master Science degree in chemistry from Purdue University and MBA degree from California State University, Northridge. Barry and his wife, Suzanne, reside in Indo near Palm Springs, California. They have two married sons, David, who is a professor of practice and director of New Jersey Institute of Technology Forensic Science Program, and Michael, an entrepreneur. He and Suzanne are the proud grandparents of eight grandchildren. Thank you, Sarah, for introducing Barry in a short, and uh, we have a very long profile for our esteemed speaker. So uh, I once again welcome on behalf of Sherlock and Suda Forensic Science India for presenting and lecture on forensic science in the United States and possible lesson for the India and other uh, developing country also. I request uh, Barry Fisher to continue his session. Sir, over to you. I think you're still screen sharing. Yes. Are we ready to go? Yes, sir. Ready to go. Okay. Over to you, sir. Okay, well, <clears throat> thank you very much for inviting me to participate on this, uh, in this lecture. Uh, we are uh, quite far away uh, right now in the uh, United States. I, I'm about 200 kilometers east of Los Angeles, and it's nigh about 9.37 in the evening, Saturday. So we're uh, almost a half a day apart uh, time-wise. And it's indeed a uh, pleasure uh, to be with you uh, today for this, uh, uh, for this uh, lecture. I'm going to uh, get started and uh, just clear up my page here. I'm going to turn on my uh, screen share. Are you seeing that okay? Yeah, perfect, sir. Very good. Okay, well, uh, I was invited to give a uh, a talk, uh, this uh, topic was uh, kind of my own cho choosing. And I thought I would uh, speak uh, about two major issues. One thing is what forensic science is like in the United States and explain how some of the uh, uh, the way things have been set up here and what, what's been going on in the U.S. Uh, might provide some useful lessons for uh, the India experience. Uh, now, mind you, I, I don't have a great deal of information about uh, forensic science or indeed the criminal justice system in India, but I suspect that uh, there are certain things that are uh, similar that uh, might uh, be instructive. And then at the end of the program, we'll uh, leave time for a Q&A. So you, you've already heard the bulk of my uh, biography. I grew up in New York City, where I uh, attended the City College of New York and received a bachelor's degree in chemistry and then moved on to the Midwest of the United States and got a master's degree in science in chemistry from Purdue University. I moved out uh, West and uh, while I was uh, working, uh, studied and uh, took a master of business administration. 
I started at the LA County Sheriff's Department Crime Lab in 19, 9, 1969. They had a very large uh, drug problem. They, they, there were so many cases that forced them to hire more chemists. And that's how I got started in the field. And I worked there for uh, a month shy of 40 years. Uh, in the last 20 of those 40 years, I was the crime laboratory director. Uh, the laboratory uh, has a staff of about 300 people. It serves uh, uh, Los Angeles County, uh, which has a population of about 10 million. And I'll talk a little bit about, a little more about forensic science in the United States. I've been actively involved in a whole host of uh, various uh, professional organizations, including the uh, American Society of Crime Labor Laboratory Directors, which is a management association uh, made up of laboratory directors, assistant directors, and supervisors. The American Academy of Forensic Sciences, which is a, uh, I guess you'd call it a scholarly uh, association uh, made up of uh, various disciplines within forensic science. I had the privilege in 1999 of hosting uh, and serving as president of the IAFS, the International Association of Forensic Sciences. Uh, I'm a member of the IAI, the International Association for Identification, uh, TAFT, the International Association of Toxicologists, and also a member of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Uh, my interests are very, very broad, and the reason for that uh, was that as I got into management, I needed to have a, a good understanding of all the various disciplines within forensic science. Along the way, I published, uh, uh, I wrote uh, or co-wrote three different, uh, three textbooks. The one on the uh, upper left, uh, Techniques of Crime Scene Investigation, the last edition, the eighth edition, I co-wrote with my son, David, who is also in forensic science. And uh, uh, the, these these books are, are readily available should you choose to uh, get a, a hold of them. If you uh, find what I have to say of interest, you can uh, connect with me either on Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, what I try to do is to uh, post pretty regularly uh, issues that uh, to me seem to be of interest going on in forensic science, both in the United States and worldwide. And if uh, you take a look at uh, the past postings, you can get an idea of some of the things that I've uh, placed on the uh, on these uh, sites. The I post the same thing on both of them, so uh, you don't have to join both if you're not interested. Uh, but you can get an idea of what's happening around the world. Uh, I, would, I would have to say that I'm pretty passionate about forensic science. I think that uh, people in the forensic sciences play a very important role in our criminal justice systems. But in addition to the use of science to, and technology, to assist law enforcement. I think uh, that uh, managers and supervisors, whether you happen to be one right now or you're uh, hoping to move up the chain along the way, also play a, a critical role in the management and operation of crime labs. And they have an important role in uh, influencing legislation and policy matters in forensic science, and uh, these are things that you should keep in mind. Uh, we are a, an extremely small portion of the criminal uh, justice system. There are all sorts of elements within the system. Uh, uh, you know, the judges, uh, prosecutors, defense attorneys, police, medical examiner system, and uh, so on. And oftentimes we don't 
usually interact with uh, one another. And uh, frequently these organizations are in different uh, places within state, local, or federal governments. And it's uh, difficult to be in touch with them. Uh, but I, I would uh, suggest to you that as you move through your careers or if you're into your careers, it would behoove you to get involved with these different groups to assist forensic science uh, throughout uh, your part of the world. So my lecture is going to uh, cover a wide variety of things. Uh, I, I always tell people in other countries where I'm speaking uh, that I don't claim to have all the answers. Uh, uh, some of the things I'm telling you uh, this morning might uh, sound like they are useful and other things just may not have any utility uh, for you at all. All I'm doing is trying to give you the benefit of my 40 years experience in the profession and then you can tack on another 10 years since I've retired because I haven't quite given up on it. And I certainly don't claim that anything I'm gonna tell you uh, this morning are gonna be the best things for your particular situations, no matter where you come from in uh, India or wherever you're listening to this uh, program. But I hope that I can spark some ideas for discussion among uh, practitioners, which may lead to some useful uh, results uh, in, your, in your endeavors. So forensic science in the United States is an adversarial system. In the courtroom, you have the lawyers fighting it out. And uh, it's oftentimes uh, uh, whoever puts together the best case. And this adversarial situation does in fact spill over into the forensic science area because um, in, in, in some parts of the world, the court system is is very kind to experts. They may not have to go to court very often and testify. They just may submit a uh, report explaining what they found. In the US, particularly in high profile cases like murders and, and rapes, it's uh, the cases you have to go to court and explain what you've uh, been doing. And what the adversarial system has uh, resulted in is much better prepared defense attorneys, um, spelled defense the way we do in the US. I think you probably spelled with a C, but whatever. Um, the, the lawyers are, are much, much, under, much better understood what goes on in, in laboratories and will ask some very pointed questions. Uh, the adversarial system, because of uh, these questions we've gotten from lawyers, have resulted in a run on laboratory accreditation, uh, typically through ISO 17025, which seems to be a standard used uh, throughout the world. There's a beginning uh, push towards practitioner certification. Uh, however, that is pretty uh, voluntary uh, right now. There's a much wider use of statistics and probability as a result of this adversarial system. Uh, you frequently will have experts on both sides, experts for the defense and experts for the prosecution. And there's a, a big pre pressing issue towards professional integrity or ethics. Uh, are there codes of ethics that uh, practitioners follow? The United States is uh, a mixture of state and federal law enforcement agencies and uh, crime labs. Uh, the federal system has uh, one set of uh, codes and then each state, we have 50 states in the US has somewhat different laws and regulations that uh, are uh, a practice. 
in the forensic area, the uh, there are probably around 10 or 12 different forensic laboratories. The largest ones, of course, are the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the Department of Defense. However, there are a number of others in different parts of the government. At the state and local level, you have uh, police departments, sheriff's departments, some laboratories are under prosecutors and others are under medical examiners or coroner's offices. So it's a, a big, wide ranging uh, situation that we have. Experts can uh, fa fa be faced uh, with uh, incisive question questioning when they testify about their education. Um, many places are, uh, are hiring people with master's degrees and uh, PhDs because, well, first of all, it's a very uh, competitive market in the United States and uh, the more academic background you have, the better off, uh, it, the more likely good to get the job. Uh, there are questions about the type of training you received uh, before you started casework. Uh, if uh, proficiency tests are part of your uh, training, uh, you might be asked in court about the error rates, both uh, individual error rates and laboratory-wide error rates, bias, uh, Confirmation bias has become a serious problem in laboratories because defense attorneys are raising the question, uh, do you have too much information from the police uh, that is perhaps causing you to lean too far one way or the other? Ethical conduct is uh, another issue that uh, frequently uh, is uh, uncovered. There have been some unfortunate cases where uh, laboratory personnel have uh, dry lab drug cases or, or made some pretty serious mistakes and didn't tell anybody about them. And, and these are some things that uh, uh, we are faced with in our particular system. And of course, when you go to court and testify, these can be uh, somewhat embarrassing to the expert. So if, if you happen to be a, a manager or a supervisor, uh, you're, you're typically juggling a whole host of uh, different issues in your day-to-day -day work. You have uh, budget concerns to worry about personnel training, hiring and firing, purchasing supplies and equipment, quality assurance, laboratory policy. You're often called to be the laboratory, the uh, department spokesman involving forensic science uh, for your agency. And you have uh, leadership uh, issues, both for your staff and within professional associations, should you become involved there. This is a map of the United States. Uh, we have a population of about 330 million, uh, quite a bit smaller than uh, uh, India is concerned. But uh, uh, we, we have some similarities. Uh, we have uh, 50 different states with, uh, on this map we don't show, I'm not showing Alaska or Hawaii. And uh, each state has a different set of uh, law, uh, laws and uh, ways of doing things. I'm located uh, out here in Southern, this is California. Uh, I'm, I'm about 200 kilometers uh, east of uh, the city of Los Angeles. I started off over here in uh, New York City and I went to uh, graduate school out here in Indiana, a place called Purdue University. But um, 
historically, uh, forensic institutes and practitioners <clears throat> didn't have an opportunity to speak with uh, one another uh, very much. So there was not much of a coordinated effort. Uh, there have been, there are a whole host of different professional associations in the United States. There's uh, uh, the IAI and the American Academy of Forensic Sciences are the two largest. Uh, the uh, National Association of Medical Examiners, which represents coroners and medical examiners offices uh, the Society of Forensic Toxicology, and uh, of course, ASCLAD, the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors. On top of that, there's a whole bunch of regional associations and uh, other organizations that I just ran out of space and didn't include them up here. Well, all of these uh, were kind of doing their own thing until uh, uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago, when a few of us who were going to Washington on a regular basis uh, met with some federal government officials and they recommended that we get as many of these groups together and form a consortium of forensic science organizations in order to try to speak with uh, one voice. And we've been doing that for uh, close to 20 years now, and it's been, it's been quite uh, effective in terms of going to uh, Congress, to the executive branch, uh, the White House, and trying to get our messages heard uh, to people who might be able to assist us. The uh, one thing that we learned through this effort is the idea of advocacy. And I'm gonna be taking a, uh, a little while now for the rest of the talk to uh, discuss advocacy or lobbying and uh, try to make a case to you that this is something that's very important and uh, that you should try to adopt if you are not already doing it. Uh, what is advocacy? Simply as a dictionary definition is the pursuit of in influencing outcomes, including policy and resource allocations, decisions within political institutions. So you're, you're, you're trying to get people outside of the, your own institute to be aware of what it is forensic scientists do and their importance to the criminal justice system. Oftentimes, uh, it's been my experience that uh, people in government outside of the laboratory system have very little understanding of what it is that goes on in uh, forensic laboratories. So to be effective, uh, you, you want to be involved with the key players, that is the the stakeholders, the people that you, that uh, are your customers in crime labs. Uh, to be effective in uh, advocacy, you have to have a realistic strategy. In other words, what it is you want to do. You can't uh, hope to get everything you want. You may have to go slowly or uh, ramp up your, uh, the things that you're after uh, in a systematic way. You want to establish a shared vision between the various elements within your group of uh, advocates, as well as the organizations that you're involved with. So for example, if uh, your agency that you're working for is, uh, is particularly concerned about sexual assault or rape cases, what is it that the laboratory can do in these cases? Uh, is DNA being used or does it have to be start, started up? Are there uh, standardized sexual assault evidence kits that are available? And if not, can they be put together by meeting with the various people that are involved with these things? Uh, 
Um, you, you need to be willing to uh, agree and, and disagree sometimes about the process. You can never hope to always get your own way. Um, one thing when trying to exercise change is you, you have to be patient because these things take times and success will be measured incrementally. You can't, um, you know, each journey begins with a single step. And uh, the, the one thing I can uh, tell you is very important is that you need to be a champion of your profession. You, you need to get out and tell uh, the people who are important to, uh, out there, your key stakeholders, uh, what forensic science is all about and what you do. Uh, who are the stakeholders? Of course, it's uh, the police that you dealing with, the lawyers, the prosecution and defenders that you work with on a regular basis, courts, judges, uh, elected officials, those are the ones who are typically going to be funding your laboratories or institutes. Uh, the public is, uh, is very important uh, to get them on uh, your side because they can exercise uh, pressure on elected officials to do things. Along with that, the media, t television and uh, newspapers can play an important uh, role. One thing that we used to do in my uh, laboratory was to peri periodically hold open houses for the media, and invite people in, invite the press in to tour the laboratories and meet with staff people uh, and get a better understanding of what we did in the laboratory. And the last one, I, I put this in red as a stakeholder are crime victims. They can be a powerful ally in uh, advocacy uh, matters. Um, excuses, uh, you'll, you'll hear all kinds of things uh, like, well, I work for a public agency and I, I just, I'm not allowed to do it or I can't do it. Uh, do you think I can just pick up the telephone and call up my elected official, uh, the mayor or head of my state? Uh, chances are my boss would not be very happy about doing that. Or I'm too far down the chain of command to be able to uh, make a difference. Uh, another common one is that I'm not allowed to lobby or to be an advocate. That's somebody else's job. Well, the fact of the matter is that public agencies, in fact, do lobby. And what you need to do is to sell the person in charge that uh, you need greater funding and this might be a way of getting that done. Uh, one way of doing this is to write a one page concise position paper to focus on your ideas and what it is that you hope to accomplish. If it's more than one page and gets too complicated, uh, people are not gonna be willing to spend the time to read that, particularly if it's their, not their issue. And find out who in your agency is the advocate. I guarantee you each major agency, whether it be a, an institute, a law enforcement agency, even a university has an advocate on staff that is working with uh, elements of uh, government to try to uh, get more resources out of those higher levels. Of course, there's an alternative to all these strategies. Uh, you can go out and do it and just ask for forgiveness uh, after you offend somebody for doing this rather than first getting uh, permission. It's probably easier to go with the permission thing, but I've used the forgiveness avenue in the past and that sometimes 
is the way of going. Here's a few tips for you to uh, consider. Uh, relationships and networking are uh, really, really helpful in any uh, advocacy or lobbying effort. Uh, the more people you know in different uh, uh, places that interact with uh, your forensic science community, uh, these can be used to your benefit. So you want to find who these key people are and stay in, in touch with them. Um, you can try to be an information source for them. So if you, you, you uncovered somebody in your state or national government who is particularly interested in some element, some aspect of uh, public safety or law enforcement, and you have some useful information, you can just uh, reach out and, and give them uh, and contact them and say, uh, or send them an, a note, an email, or, or a packet of information to let them know you were thinking of, about them. And try to keep regularly in touch with these people because uh, these uh, networks that you build can be very important. If you have to write a letter to a representative in your government, uh, here are some points you can consider. Oftentimes, if you have a professional association, it's easier to do this rather than from your own, from your own institute. First thing you want to do is to state the purpose of what it is you're writing about. What, is, what are you asking for uh, in this uh, effort? Uh, you want to keep it short and to the point. You don't want to go on and on and get lost in great detail. Chances are they're not going to be very interested in that level of information. You want to build a case. Uh, why do you feel that uh, this is so important? And you want to couch it in a way that they understand how it affects the overall public safety and criminal justice system, not just the forensic institute, because oftentimes um, policymakers are just not going to uh, understand. I, I remember I was taking a high level uh, person from my agency through my laboratory and my, my organization had, has at the time uh, almost 20,000 employees. So I had, it was taking the number two or number three person through the laboratory. And I was pointing out an expensive piece of equipment that we were trying to upgrade. It was a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. And he asked me, what was the cost of that? I told him, and he says, do you know how many police cars or helicopters I can buy for that amount of money? And, and luckily, I, I had given some thought to this, and I was able to explain why it was important in identifying drugs that were a big issue for our agency at the time. Um, you can ask the uh, individual you're pitching what their particular point of view on it on the subject is, as I said before, uh, keep it to uh, one page. Uh, you want to type it and not just uh, handwrite it out, even if you do have excellent handwriting. Be sure to include your contact information. So in case they have any questions later on that they will be able to get back to you. Some things about advocacy. Um, back in high school and college, I took some classes in what was called the either government or political science. And I thought I understood the way things were. But there are a few things that uh, will give you, will prepare you for things that might happen in the legislation process. 
uh, we have a we we have a uh, a way of expressing this uh, that passing laws at least this is in the United States it may or may not be the same in India is a bit like making sausage you you really don't want to know how it's done because it can be very messy and uh, that's certainly the case in the legislative process. So again, uh, uh, that's just what I said, that uh, you can pretty much forget anything you've learned in college or high school about how governments uh, work. You're going to typically be dealing with very young staffers as opposed to the principal in an elected position. And these individuals are likely to come across as very arrogant and be know-it-alls. They, uh, they saw a crime show, a movie dealing with forensic science or a TV show, and they know all about it. So if you do decide to lobby or become an advocate, uh, you want to plan your pitch. What's the best way to get your particular issue to another individual? What is your issue? Um, you want to write it down, keep it to the point, state the problem and what it is you want as a result of uh, your meeting. You want to tell the person who you are and, and what you do. Uh, be very specific in what it is you're asking. Keep the number of things that you're asking to a few. Don't try to get everything under the sun in this effort. Uh, be a resource to the individual uh, if they have an interest in this particular area. Uh, for example, uh, in, in the US when uh, DNA was first coming aboard, coming online in a big way. Uh, people in government were very, very interested in understanding what was going on. And we actually took, invited some of them to nearby forensic laboratories for them to see what the process looked like and to talk with uh, individuals. So they had a, a better appreciation uh, there, there are very few scientists who are in government, and chances are you're going to be dealing with people who study the law or political science or other such fields, and uh, you want to be able to be there to help them out. Uh, building relationships with these people is very, very important. They can help you out later on. And after you finish with them, follow it up with a, a letter, a written letter, not a computer-based email, a handwritten letter here to express your appreciation for the amount of time uh, that they've given you. And if there are any further questions they may have to, please feel free to, uh, to contact them. Uh, over here, writing letters has almost become a lost art. And I also suggest for those of you who are looking for jobs and going out to interview at different institutes, when you finish with your interview and you get back home, write a letter back to the individual you met with and express your thanks for them taking time and uh, just as a way of following up. You should try to uh, learn how you can become an influencer, someone who can move the process along. And I realize that if you're in a laboratory setting and all you're doing is doing assays or tests and whatnot, this is, these are things that you typically are not thinking about, but uh, you, you want to give some thought, some attention to try to uh, become part of uh, this process. It may help you in the long run to move up in your organization. Uh, 
develop some sort of plan of action. Uh, it's helpful to write these things down and decide how you're going to approach these efforts as you get along. I mentioned earlier about the news media. Uh, they can be some powerful allies that you have. It's often not looked upon well to be talking to the press, but if you can have an informal relationship with them without giving away too much sensitive information about cases that you're working on, that's something to consider. Crime victims are also an important resource. We uh, cultivated relations with uh, groups here in the States. There's, there's one power, particularly powerful group. Uh, drunk driving is a big problem that we have here. And uh, one of the groups that was started up many years ago was called Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. These are typically moms or dads that have lost children through uh, traffic accidents caused by drunk drivers. And they can be a very, very powerful resource to the laboratory when you're trying to get more personnel and staffing. The same is true with uh, sexual assault evidence. We've had very large backlogs in sexual assault kits and we connected with uh, rape victims who went to uh, uh, testify before the uh, United States Congress and at our state levels to help us get more resources to uh, address these uh, problems. So as I said earlier, you want to be patient. Uh, uh, you, you can't expect uh, to move uh, things uh, rapidly. They take a while. Uh, you want to keep good humor because uh, uh, oftentimes you can get very disheartened that things are not moving away, along as well as you might wish. So you, you, you want to be able to laugh at some of this stuff. You want to aim high and don't give up. This is, uh, it's, not a, it's not a short race, it's a marathon. You want to take your time getting there. Uh, here's a couple of pictures. You can, there's uh, me over here. We're meeting, oops. We're meeting right outside of the, uh, in Washington, D.C., in uh, outside of the United States Senate. Uh, this distinguished looking fellow here, his name is Jeff Sessions. He was a senator, former prosecutor who was very instrumental and helpful in our efforts. He later became uh, United States Attorney General and uh, uh, you just ne never know where these people are going to uh, wind up. Another uh, visit that we made, uh, there's me again. This guy was a senator at the time, Joe Biden. He went on to become vice president of the United States and is currently running uh, for president of the United States. So you, you just you just don't know how these things are going to turn out. Uh, I'm sure Joe has no recollection of uh, uh, us getting together, but uh, who knows? Uh, these, these things uh, uh, might happen. So we're going to start uh, now with a Q&A, and I want to uh, thank you for your efforts, and I'm going to uh, turn off my screen sharing and get back over here. So here we go. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Barry, sir, for taking such an informative session. Now I will uh, request the participant, if they have any query, they can raise your question. Uh, they can raise your hand. I will unmute from here and they can uh, ask the question to the, our eminent speaker. Participant, you can type your query also. Uh, 
any participant they have any query i think it is a well explained uh, session so there is a one query from the aparna if uh, uh, what is the difference between the in a, uh, indian scenario and the us scenario if you have any idea about uh, uh, related to the indian scenario and the us scenario well i i think that um India, like the United States, and of course more so with India, is going to be very, very broad. And I, I do you? Is there a, a, a national professional association in uh, India at the present time that deals with uh, uh, forensic science from a scientific point of view? Well. Another query from Gayatri, sir. I'm a forensic graduate student, and I'm planning to specialist in ballistics. Can you please explain about the scope of forensic ballistics in coming scenario? Say again. Uh, can you explain the uh, scope of forensic ballistics in coming scenario? Well, um, forensic firearms identification is uh, very. Uh, very important. It uh, requires a lot of uh, training to uh, uh, both uh, identify uh, whether a, uh, a bullet can, comes from a specific firearm and also to uh, measure the, uh, the trajectory of the, uh, of the bullet. Uh, these things uh, take a uh, fair amount of uh, training to accomplish. Okay. Uh, Kanheri, she wants to ask for a question. Kanheri, you can ask. Sir, uh, what is the time investigation process in US? Like, uh, who is the first responding officer or uh, what the forensic plays role in that scenario? Hello. Can you can you repeat the question? I didn't quite understand. Uh, sir, uh, what is the crime investigation process in the uh, U.S.? Like, uh, which are the team which respond first, and how the all process uh, goes up throughout this investigation? Okay, I, th I think you were asking about crime scene investigation. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Well, some crime scene investigation is under the uh, forensic laboratory and other, in other cases, it's part of uh, the police. Uh, depending on the uh, level of uh, the, the types of evidence that's, that is collected, the, the, there may be uh, forensic, forensic science, uh, persons from the laboratory that go out to the crime scene. Oftentimes, it's just going to be a, a CSI or crime scene investigator that uh, doesn't have uh, 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 training in, uh, in the sciences. They may, have, uh, they may have a law enforcement background or uh, training in uh, criminal justice and rules of evidence, uh, it, it really depends on the nature of, uh, uh, of the crime. In, in, some, in some laboratories, like the laboratory that I was associated with, people from the laboratory regularly went out to uh, crime scene, serious crime scenes like uh, murders and arson, bombing cases, occasionally rape cases to assist the crime scene investigator in uh, identifying and collecting evidence and uh, consulting with the detectives at the scene of the crime uh, on uh, how to use the evidence most effectively. So there is one question from uh, 
YouTube live. Uh, uh, what all certification we require to work in a United State laboratory? The uh, the minimum requirements are a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry, biology, forensic science. Um, many people are coming to the job right now with um, masters and PhD levels because it's uh, fairly competitive. Uh, the, the difficulty right now in, in the U United States is that uh, un unfortunately our present government is uh, not uh, terribly uh, interested in bringing uh, people outside of the U.S. in uh, to work in any fields right now. And I, I think uh, you, you, you're going to have to be patient and wait till after the next election and see what happens because I suspect that many of these rules that they've uh, put in place will uh, be part. Yeah. So uh, Ramandeep Singh, he wants to ask a question. Uh, Ramandeep, over to you. Thank you. Um, hi, Barry. Do you, is there a certification or a certificate, like a statewide certificate that someone needs to practice forensics in US? The cer certification program in uh, laboratories and crime laboratories uh, is more, it is not a requirement. It's mm -hmm. a voluntary certification that uh, uh, people will uh, try to will, will get to uh, help them out in courtroom because mm -hmm. it's that they uh, know more than somebody who doesn't have a certificate. Uh, the, the only, uh, once you get into fields like uh, forensic pathology, like medical examiners, uh, there, uh, it's it's a license that uh, physicians have, but for forensic chemists and forensic biologists, it's uh, right now it's just voluntary. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So another question we have from the uh, Rajesh Verma sir: Most of the forensic labs comes under the police department in Indian scenario, basically. That can be a bias. The scientists how they address this problem. Can statistics and the probability have a scope in this scenario? Well, I would say in the United States, the majority of uh, laboratories are under the police as well. And uh, we, we are frequently asked about the question of, uh, of bias. There, there was a, in 2009, it was a major report uh, that came out uh, from the National Academy of Sciences, which stated that uh, laboratories should not be part of the uh, of police departments. And uh, here we are, uh, 10 years later, uh, we're still under police departments. Uh, I, 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 I've always I've always laughed because that same body, the National Academy of Sciences, in the 1920s, I believe it was, issued a report that the United States should get off the English measurement system and go to the, uh, I guess at the time was the French system, namely uh, grams and uh, meters and uh, uh, measurements like that instead of feet and inches and gallons. But we're still, I think we're uh, one of two countries in the world that still uh, are on that system. So it's it's just the way it is. I, I, I think uh, that laboratories should be aware of it and uh, uh, deal with these things as they come, up, come along. 
the, uh, the person who's done the most amount of work in the issue of bias is a chap in London, England, by the name of Itiel Dror, D-R-O-R. He's written quite a bit uh, about it, and you, you might want to see if he would be willing to uh, uh, give one of these lectures for you, and uh, that might help you out. One common question coming from many participants, uh, because we have many participants as a master's, uh, they have the master's in forensic odontology. So they want to ask like uh, Dr. Arpita, Dr. Meena Acharya, they want to ask that, what is a scope of forensic odontology in forensic science laboratory of the USA? Uh, forensic odontology or forensic dentistry has been criticized a great deal in, in the courts and by lawyers. The, the curious thing about forensic odontology is that the vast majority of dentists who are involved in this are independent contractors. They, uh, they have their day job as uh, general, general dentists who uh, fill teeth and drill cavities and whatnot. And then on the side, they assist as consultants with uh, investigations. And as I, as I said, that they have been under a great deal of uh, fire and controversy about uh, how effective is their methods of identifying bite marks as coming from a particular individual or bites into a particular piece of food. And it's, it's um, most of these things wind up in court and they will have to address uh, experts from the other side who, who will likely be saying, yeah, well, you, uh, your techniques have not been validated. Uh, you don't have any uh, specific criteria for uh, identifying an individual and uh, so your techniques are not any good and of course dentists who are involved in this have a, a different kind of uh, assertion. I, I think uh, one of the ways of dealing with uh, that kind of uh, issue and it's, uh, it goes beyond just dentistry but any type of comparative analysis say footwear evidence, shoe print, uh, or tire impression evidence, uh, fingerprint evidence, firearms evidence, is not to make absolute statements, but rather to say that uh, based on your training and experience, uh, it's, it's my opinion that these two samples come from a common source. Uh, if you're asking me, is, uh, am I 100% certain? Uh, could I be mistaken? Well, nobody's, nobody's perfect. And I, I think uh, uh, if, if you try that approach, that might uh, be helpful. Vaishnavi uh, Michali, you can ask your question. Yes, Vaishnavi. Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, there is any concept about half murder? About what? Sir, there is any concept about half murder in US? I've not heard of that term. I'm heard that about half murder, so I'll ask you. I know nothing about that. I think okay, it's more uh, countable and uncountable kind of sort of uh, cases where uh, those murders are considered as murder, but they they are not countable as a murder. So it's it's kind of a confusion that we have back in India. It's 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 a very India specific term. Very. I that's uh, this is the first time I've. Uh come across it. Now, there are different degrees of uh, homicide 
in our criminal law, there's first degree, second degree murder, third degree murder, of manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter, uh, and, and it depends on, first of all, how the prosecutor decides to charge the individual and what they need to prove for uh, uh, these, these different uh, uh, subsets of uh, murder. But I, I've, I'm not at all familiar with the, uh, the notion of half murder. So what is considered if, if uh, the victim is badly wounded but survives and makes a full recovery? Uh, how's the punishment like in that case? Uh, then it would be uh, attempted murder. Okay, yeah, that's half murder in India. That's okay. Yep. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much, Vai, sir, for uh, enlightening us with the different aspects of the forensic science in U USA and uh, how uh, Indian scenario and other scenario can take that uh, opportunity to learn. And uh, moving to us forward, because we are uh, on time, uh, so moving to us forward, I will request you to accept our uh, certificate, uh, which we used to give for our eminent speakers. So kindly this certificate of appreciation for delivering a lecture on forensic science in the United States and the possible lessons for the India. With this, I would uh, like to, you know, for any uh, uh, elder or for any uh, mentor or for any, I can say, uh, brother, it's a great, great opportunity that uh, if uh, uh, his younger is doing something good. So I would like to request Ramandeep to give some scenario about his journey from India, forensic scenario to the USA. He is working with, uh, in a wall security. So Ramandeep, I would like to uh, give a few inputs about a few, uh, whatever you have learned in these days so that other audience can be benefited because many of uh, they want to uh, know that how they can move to the USA, how they can uh, uh, take, a, uh, take a career opportunity in the USA. So you, if you can uh, put some light on this. For sure, thank you, sir. Um, so, I mean, I, I think, I believe all of all of us have learned a lot from this session from Sir Barry Fisher. This session's like, a, you know, drinking water from a fire hose type of a session where I was kind of out of control and there is a lot of stuff to learn from this. Uh, so thank you for for this session, uh, Barry. I am currently in Chicago uh, downtown from almost four years. I started my journey from uh, Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science as a cyber forensics investigator uh, under guidance of Dr. Ranjit Singh. And, uh, you know, for me personally as well, I had a privilege of working with him uh, and being my mentor. I think he have he have trained me with tons of knowledge and skills that he have. Uh, my journey from India to US is sort of uh, a bumpy ride, I must say, because I'm not a citizen at this point in the United States, but I've, I've had privilege to work with some departments in the United States and some national laboratories. We have one here in Argonne, uh, 40 miles south from Chicago downtown. I've had a chance to work with them for a forensics case uh, after a security clearance. So that's that's one of the challenges that we have uh, being an Indian here in the United States. Um, so that was my another question as well. If, if someone who is not a citizen or doesn't have a specific secret service, uh, like a, you know, clearance, is, is, there, is there a possibility of the person getting his or her foot, foothold in this uh, industry? Barry. The, the... The only way that you're going, you would be successful is you. You need to find a somebody who is willing to um, help you out in getting a position. In other words, somebody. Mm -hmm. If if the laboratory you're you're looking to work in, uh, if if the head of that laboratory is willing to uh, um, try to deal with the appropriate uh, governmental agencies to uh, an, 
enable you to get a green card, which is uh, a kind of visa to uh, for a non-citizen to work in the United States. Mm -hmm. That's about the only way. Okay. The, the biggest challenge that you will face is uh, uh, they have to, the person who is supporting you has to be able to say that there are no United States citizens with the type of experience that you have, and it's essential that I hire, that I have this person work for me, mm -hmm. do the work. Uh, it, it's it's very very hard, especially right right now. Uh, if 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 you're in the states and you're following any of the news, uh, it, it's very disheartening. Uh, and it's, it's not only Indians, it's, it's any non-citizen that uh, is, uh, is having, maybe having uh, uh, problems uh, in, in coming over here. It, it's always been difficult, uh, but not impossible. Now it, the, the dial has moved a little bit more to being uh, more impossible or mm. probably not imp totally impossible, but it's very hard. And they, they tend to be individual uh, cases. It's not one uh, sh one shoe size fits all. It's uh, on an individual case. So if you if, if you're if you're consulting or working with somebody, mm. you need to ask that uh, uh, department that you're working with, if mm -hmm. uh, they're willing to uh, try to help you to get the right kind of visa to work with them on a more permanent level. Yeah, you know, that's in process. I just thought of having this discussion in this session because I think there are tons of participants that are interested in, in their, uh, you know, uh, further studies in, in, in United States and uh, coming forward here and working in some departments there. But no, thank you so much um, for your time today. And on, uh, you know, on behalf of Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science India, I would uh, like to express my appreciation to you and for taking out time this, uh, you know, late night. Uh, you said you are in LA. Uh, it's almost 10.30 or 11ish, I guess. Yes. So, uh, you know, when sharing your previous pre precious knowledge, uh, I'm sorry, I'm stammering a little bit here, but all your suggestions throughout in this session were really informative. I am, uh, I was looking at some of the participants who had their uh, videos switched on and they were taking notes on their cop like, you know, notebooks and all that. So, um, uh, all in all, this was really, really helpful for all of us. And I would also like to thank all the participants for joining this uh, this seminar and uh, to Dr. Ranjit Kumar Singh as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you for uh, you know addressing the problem and uh, the query which you asked to Barry. I once again, uh, on behalf of my co-host Ramandeep Singh and the Seza Azeen, I welcome Barry and request Barry to accept our certificate of appreciation for delivering this lecture. I also like to thank my team, those who are uh, doing uh, dedicate, uh, dedicatedly to reach to the, all the audience, uh, solving their queries, sending link for the session and other things. All my supporting teams, I would like to present that certificate of appreciation to my supporting team on the, my uh, team also, like uh, Seza Azim, Afrin Taranum, Pratika, Tanya, Janita, Vaishnavi, Kailash, Lakshya, Pooja, uh, Nitika, Saddam, uh, like this, uh, I would, uh, uh, and Sudhakar, uh, like this, I would uh, like to take the closing remark from the Barry. And after that, I will explain you how you can get your certificate uh, of this session. Uh, Barry, over to you for closing remark. Okay. Well, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a pleasure to uh, participate in uh, these uh, sorts of programs. I, I've uh, this is the, let's see, the, the third or fourth one I've done in various parts of India. And uh, uh, it's, it's interesting to uh, 
uh, hear what people have to say. I, I, I hope that uh, my American English accent uh, is, uh, is understandable. I, I know that uh, uh, we, all, uh, we all speak with uh, a little different accent, uh, depending on where in the world we're at. And uh, so I, I do hope that you were able to understand what I was, uh, what I was saying. And uh, uh, as I said, it, it, was, uh, it was very uh, instructive. Uh, you can reach out to me uh, through either LinkedIn or, or uh, uh, Twitter if you, uh, if you have any, any other information or specific questions that you might have. And uh, it's, it's been a great honor to uh, be with you uh, this morning. Yeah, so thank okay. you so much uh, uh, once again on behalf of Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science. Now, many participants, those who have registered, uh, how you can download your certificate. So you have to visit the same website where you have done the registration like forensicevents.com. You have to click here on download certificate you have to put your email ID, whatever the email ID you have uh, uh, registered with. Like uh, if I put this, uh, and uh, this, this was the 13th session. So you can download uh, of uh, certificate, whatever the session you have attended. So here, here you will see that, uh, here uh, you will see all the uh, certificate which you have attended. Like uh, if I say the recent one, let me show that uh, applicants detail and uh, check any random applications. This is like for uh, this Dr. Abirami, if I check. So you have to just put your number here and uh, you will find whatever the webinar you have attended uh, organized by Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science. So here you can see this is the webinar uh, this is a webinar by the very, you can see that name, Forensic Science in United States and Possible Lessons for India. And date, 12 July, congratulations, you are uh, participated and you are eligible for this certificate. So here you can see, here you'll find the option of download certificate. You can download certificate in a JPG format. Similarly, in the mobile, if you are doing through the mobile, you have to be uh, scroll down to check this link download uh, now and you will get that JPG image in your mobile download uh, box. So uh, preferably if you do through the laptop, it will be come in a very easy way. By this way, you can download your certificate of this session and easily you can access your old certificate also. And if you can uh, verify your certificate also from here, that verification link. Uh, that certificate is issued by us or not. So uh, this is the one. Uh, you can easily download your certificate. And uh, if anyone have any query related to the certificate of they have, or they have any difficulty to downloading the certificate, they can go to the contact box and they can uh, reach here by writing that uh, problem why they are not able to download the certificate. So by this way, I would uh, like to once again, thank you uh, very for taking our time and giving uh, a great uh, informative session on this uh, aspects of the forensic science. Uh, by uh, this, uh, I will uh, mm, like to close this session along with my co-host Ramandeep Singh and the Sridharsin. Thank you so much. Thank you all the participants from the different uh, uh, part of the globe. See you on the next Sunday with another exciting lecture. We'll announce soon on our website, uh, on our social media platform and on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.